Okay, so hey everyone and welcome to this afternoon session on uh, taking open source Cloud Foundry to production. Uh, my name is uh, Fabian Keller. I'm working as a software engineer at Mimacom. Uh, we're a solution provider for complex digitalization projects. So we're doing lots of individual projects for other companies. At home, I'm enjoying woodworking. So if any one of you is like also enjoying woodworking, I'm happy to chat afterwards. And for the tech topics I'm interested in, it's obviously cloud platforms. Um, but I'm also passionate about like system architecture in general, design systems or DevOps. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is prefixed with an underscore because my name is quite popular in Germany. So there's like any valid combinations already taken. So there's the prefix underscore. Just keep that in mind. OK, that's the bunch of us at Mimacom. We've had our 20 year anniversary this year. Um, so we all met and this is the whole bunch. Um, anyone can see me? <laughs> Probably not. It's like somewhere in the back, but um, yeah, so that's it with the marketing part, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so let's get started about what this really is about. So like we're talking about open source Cloud Foundry now. So open source Cloud Foundry is like tempting and like it's really interesting. And but why would you do this like in the first place? Um, so we identified like three re reasons why people or like generally want to, to do open source Cloud Foundry. The first reason obviously is privacy. Uh, so you can run and take open source Cl Cloud Foundry and run it where you think the data is secure. Uh, so that's really nice. But it's also about control. So you can like with open source Cloud Foundry, like you're really in control. You can do anything you want. Um, basically, you just take the code, get it and, and have it. Um, and you also have access to the platform. So you're like not locked into something you can't access. Um, like if you have a hosted Cloud Foundry solution somewhere, uh, but you can really access all the logs and, and things. Uh, so that's why people like to use open source uh, Cloud Foundry. When generally speaking, there's like two sides to this. Um, so the one side, oh, let's do this. Um, and the other one, like the other positions, like let's better not do this. Uh, so who's in, who in the room has used open source Cloud Foundry before? Is there anyone here? So already deployed and to production. Yep. So some hands went down, but we have someone also in the room. That's really nice. Um, so the people that say, let's do this, uh, they commonly say, OK, OHCF is like easy. Um, it's like basically the same technology. We can do this. There's even no license cost, which is pretty cool. Um, but it has a price, obviously. Um, on the other spectrum, it's more like, oh, it's really scary. We don't have support. Um, and also, like what I hear often, we're like not an open source company, right? So it, it's like people and companies start to get a handle of open source with Cloud Foundry because usually they, they don't do open source at all. Uh, so that's also like really like the, on the contrary side. Where I'm going to talk to you is somewhere in the middle. So I, I'm not here to say it's like super easy, you can do it. I'm also not here to say it's like impossible, but I'm trying to make up some, some points for you where you can judge for yourself whether it's like worth it or not, uh, because it has some drawbacks, of course. And I'm talking about the challenges we faced. Um, and to make this talk like really tailor it to open source, I'm going to talk about the challenges that are unique uh, to open source Cloud Foundry that we have identified. So I mean, deploying a cloud platform itself, whether it's open source or a vendor distribution, regardless, it's like a challenge by itself. But I want to like really boil it down to what's unique uh, to the open source Cloud Foundry. Um, we did this for a customer. So our case was we had like 900 application instances up and running on two foundations and we wanted to shift them uh, to open source uh, Cloud Foundry. There were like 200 uh, software engineers involved and we had like six months from project initiation to go live, which was kind of an arbitrary <laughs> number. Um, but we had these six months and we had to go live um, and we actually made it. We were like six platform engineers, uh, so three from the customer and three from our side, um, where we worked uh, like in a combined team um, to make this happen. We went through four phases uh, in general to, to ship this project. So the first was like the planning phase. We like initially had to decide like where it is going to be in the data center, how, we're, how big do we do things, like what's the domain and stuff. 
So that took some time also because it's like on premise. So they had to order things and create firewall requests and all these type of things. And then we actually started deploying it. And it's like, oh, we can, we really can do this. So it actually worked, <laughs> which was great. And we just went live. And like afterwards, we like realized, okay, now it's time to update and change things. Uh, so this was like kind of um, the first things where things got trickier because now we were live and we couldn't just change the platform. Um, and where we are today is like really taking things to concourse, automating a lot and building pipelines. Um, so we're somewhere in between that operating and thriving uh, phase at this point. But I think this, these four phases are typically the ones you go through from, from like really taking open source Cloud Foundry and starting out to really going pr to production. Along the way, we faced uh, some challenges. So naturally, we had some technological challenges. Um, I mean, it's like a complex product by itself, uh, but there were actually more um, challenges we faced. And I personally think that these challenges are sometimes the harder challenges to solve. Uh, we've had some organizational challenges. Um, for those of you who were in, in Basel last year, and you might remember the picture I just had to take this. Uh, it's like really a famous building in, in Basel where we had the last CF summit. Um, but there's also like process uh, challenges. So lots of processes we had in, in the company were affected or might be affected. And last but not least, like cultural uh, challenges we faced. So I want to first start off with technological uh, challenges. So for developers uh, in the first place, like using the platform, there's actually no difference. That's the good part. So it's still open source. It's like any vendor distribution. It's like it's got the same cloud controller API. It has the same way of pushing applications. So there's like for them, there's not really a difference. It's like the same experience for them. They have the same like operations constraints and, and, and things. They have the, the exact same runtime. I mean, from, from a build pack perspective, um, or at least there should be. I mean, there's like version differences and, and things, but apart from that, it's like really the same platform. Uh, there's one thing that's different, that's uh, data services, of course. Uh, so in, luckily the data or the, the customer didn't use any data services that were like only for proprietary use. So during the migration, we could just neglect any data services because they were external, like running on on-premise things. So that's was pretty convenient and we only had to like migrate the runtime, which is why we, it was even possible to do this in the six months, I believe. Uh, so then like if it's the same, so what's actually the difference? So if we take open source Cloud Foundry, we have a set of components. Um, those components, you can just go to GitHub, download them, to Bosch IO, download the releases. Uh, you can look at them and what what the difference to vendor distributions is, is that they are just like packaged differently. So there's like some jobs are on other VMs and co-located here and there. Uh, so they're just like vendors typically just like move around these boxes. But in the end, you have the same code, right? It's like all the certified distributions, they have like kind of, I mean, they didn't patch or change any of the code. They might have just changed the packaging by itself. And by packaging, I mean also like in OSCF, we have like YAML packaging and things. And with a vendor distribution, we typically have some user interface where we can do things. So what, what's really nice about the vendor is that it hides operational complexity. Um, so that means we have this operational complexity now. And the first thing for the whole team was like to really dive deep on learning Bosch. Uh, so, I mean, Bosch is like the central deployment component. Uh, we wrote a lot of scripts um, for Bosch. So all the deployments were like scripted in, in, in bash script files. And we had these, um, well, we used the CF deployment uh, base uh, YAML and we used all these um, operations files. So we used upstream operations files, of course. Then as we were deploying like multiple environments, we had some like environment specific um, operations files that only apply to a single environment and some environment agnostic files. And we came up with this um, way of like putting them in different folders, organizing them so we could reuse them across environments. 
And all of that makes up just a single, I mean, that's just an excerpt of, of the real file, um, but in fact, it's like how we do things. So we have the operations and usually we have vars files as well. So we have like the operations file and on the same hand, we have like a vars file that really does the specific configuration for that environment. That means the operations file would like have something to change the IP address and the environments file would then actually set the IP address for the specific environment. And this worked out pretty well. So with this structure, we could work a lot. And to move forward here and really take this to production, we had to, do, to deal with a lot of like different concerns. So all these kind of things you need to do. And actually, we were just like looking at what's there. And there's a, actually, there's really a lot in, in building up a production environment. So you typically want to take care of backup and restore. So in CF deployment, there's actually just a lot of um, ops files that do this for you. Uh, there's log management. So there was the enable component syslog operations files that streams the logs uh, to a syslog endpoint. We have even some monitoring um, operations files. The resurrector is enabled by default, which just restarts VM on VMs on failure. Um, we had like a template for instance sizing. So there's a scale to one AZ. Um, we just repurposed this, used the ops file and like wrote our own based on that. Um, it's actually the CF deployment is like high available by default. So that's also pretty nice. Um, there's lots of security operations files like put this certificate here, do MTLS there. Uh, so that's also convenient. You can just like look at what's there take them and really secure and harden the environment uh, that we were building. Uh, so that turned out to be great, um, like as a starting point, but still we had to tailor some things. So we really started like writing own operations files. So for example, we had some LDAP integration. We wrote this um, operations file for LDAP. And now when you're like starting to write operations files, then the team needs to know what to write Right. So because I mean, it's like you need to understand what happens here. So to understand this, um, it's really great. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but on Bosch IO, you can just go to the releases tab on the on the top and just choose your release and then just write go into the documentation. And for all the properties you have here, there's typically at least one sentence describing what it actually does. So I mean, so the team had to learn just to go there. Um, see what needs to be changed, skim through the documentation and see then like, do we need this? Don't we need this? And that was like kind of difficult in the beginning, but it turned out that the more you do this, the easier it gets. But then at some point we, there's like, for example, this add shadow user on login property here to the right. So uh, it's actually cut off currently. So you can't read what it does. And suppose you don't understand the text here. So what would you do? It's like, how do you get more information about this when the documentation is not sufficient? So what you can do is like with this add user on login, you just, or what we typically do is we just go to the release repository. So for example, to the UAA release, and we just put this into the GitHub search. So it turns out that this specific property is used here by the release to set this, um, to set this uh, property in the config file. So, and from here, we just did another GitHub search in the UAA um, repository because from there you can now find out what this property does when it's in the configuration file of the UAA. And from there we figured that like it's being repurposed as a property here and exposed. So it's been renamed. So we need to search again. <laughs> and eventually we found what it does. So this is like during the authentication method, it just creates a user inside UAA. And that's what this configuration flag is for. So we traced down this configuration that we had in Bosch to the real source code, and we understood it, what it does. And we could even have some context about why the source code is there, because in Git, you can hit the blame button on GitHub, and you actually see the people and why they changed specific lines of code. And this is an approach we use really often, um, because that's how you like run open source Cloud Foundry, right? You need to understand what, what happens. And if the documentation isn't enough, you need to go there. So the number one advice here is like, just don't be afraid to dive into the source code. Uh, that really turned out to be useful, but it's a skill that everyone needs to learn. 
So that's really difficult, um, especially if people are more from, from operations and not like from software development. They are maybe not that familiar with bigger projects and source code. So that really was, was challenging. Another challenge we faced is, I mean, we had the existing workload to, so to really go to production, we had to like shift the, the traffic, right? So what we did in the end, we wrote this um, migration proxy. Uh, so we just deployed this on the old foundation as a route service, uh, which is really nice because Cloud Foundry allows us to build this route service. Uh, so what developers could do is, I mean, the, the traffic still went to the old foundation and the route service kicked in, intercepted the request and just proxied it to the new foundation. So like by using a service, um, the developer could by himself like switch the traffic. And once he was confident, he could like issue the route change um, with the DNS team. So that, that was just separate and it took some time for them to change entries and things like how it's usually, well, how it usually happens in an enterprise. But eventually they figured or they also could, could do this. Um, but I won't, don't want to go too deep uh, into the technical specifics, um, but more focus on, on the different challenges we had in these other areas here. So organizational, when we started the project, we figured, okay, we, we need to hire someone with at least 10 years experience operating a platform as a service um, who ideally like contributes to Cloud Foundry, um, who already did a Bosch deployment. And it's like, probably you won't find anyone. Um, so we changed this. So required skills like who has used the past before? It's like, who knows Cloud Foundry? That's pretty, pretty good already. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, that's how it is. And, and actually, um, a funny coincidence happened, uh, like when we were starting the project, we actually hired someone for, for the project and it was like from the left side. So um, we had support. Um, we found someone who really did this before. Um, so he was available part time. So that turned out to be a really <laughs> valuable resource. But that's like really luck in this. Um, so. Um, Typically, you start on the right side. So instead of hiring, what you can do is like upskilling. And we invested a lot in, in all the skills of the team members. And this is like really something you need to do in the team. Like, um, I mean, you need to invest in the culture of, of learning and upskilling because it's not done by just doing a workshop. You need to do this continuously because there's so much to learn. We had like JSON, YAML, JQ, Git, S3, Concourse, Bosch, all these moving parts. And like no one in the team has used them before. I mean, people are like from the customer, they were more like system operators. So they, they were not used. I mean, they used Unix, the CLI tools and things, but they were not like software developers using Git all the time, using S3 buckets like everywhere. So we really like from the scratch started like teaching what's actually JSON, what options do we have, what YAML syntax is possible so that everyone in the team knew what, what so that no one, like when there was a star or some weird other symbols, asked themselves, what, what's that actually? And that is really something that worked pretty well for us. Um, we also did this like initially in workshops, but then also during pairing and mob programming. So I still remember like the first day I, I went to the client where we really started the deployment we all gathered like a group of four people in a small meeting room. We had just one screen and one laptop and someone was always at the keyboard. And we were like really deploying Cloud Foundry there. And then the manager came by and he, he just looked at us and like, why are you in this room all day? You could like go out, there's like more screens, more keyboards. I don't really understand what you're doing here. And that's kind of the thing that happens. So, I mean, no one in the organization is used to working like that. Uh, so it's like, that's kind of the actual challenge. I mean, the manager was nice, so he was easy to convince that this is the best way to share the knowledge and things. Um, but still, I mean, it's kind of like, it's just a new way of working. Um, so what's also like from an organizational perspective, what's different is uh, risk management. So typically you do risk management, but for open source Cloud Foundry, it's, um, well, it's not too different actually. I think the platform has the same risks per se, so you can like it, 
the risk of being offline, of being hacked, whatever. But just the probability is higher in some places um, because there's more you can do as an operator and there's more that can go wrong while you're doing it. So the chances kind of are higher that you break it, like not on purpose, but because of some, some weird changes also because you probably don't have a perfect testing uh, setup. Uh, so there's just a, a, a bigger risk um, you need to deal with. Um, also, what's different is that there's just no risk outsourcing. Um, so typically what an enterprise does, okay, we have a risk here, so let's just find someone we can pay who covers this risk. And that's it. But you can't do this with open source, right? So you need to like accept the risk or find someone who's willing <laughs> to do whatever to minimize this risk. But um, event, what it like ends up with, all you can do is like prepare and upskill. Um, so like by learning, and having these things there in place, uh, that's what you can really do to minimize uh, the risk. From a process perspective, I mean, there's lots of processes involved and typically organizations have lots of processes to get things to production. So that's where they really are like finger pointing, like who's gonna click the button, who's gonna do this and that. Um, and that's really interesting so for example we've had build packs um, so I mean we, we got the, the build packs from from github and we just build the build packs ourselves and take them to production so we have like conquerors up and running um, it's just using the standard build pack packager but it's a binary in, in the end or a zip file with with the scripts and things and we build this ourselves so it's like not that we deploy like pre-compiled things that we get from somewhere but this is actually what like the team builds. And this is also new in an enterprise context in most places, because usually they just buy software and run it. But now this is really about taking like infrastructure code, compiling it by yourself and then taking it to production. There's also like, we compiled the build packs in the first place and then wrote them out. And so you can see that this is a real thing. There's also some failures here, which I like did on purpose. Uh, so they work. <laughs> these pipelines um, but just that you can see I mean you have pipeline failures also so that's like what you need to deal with um, next to build packs we also have like upgrade automation um, so we are like still working on that um, but at least what we did for the deployment we rolled out and deployed everything with a concourse pipeline uh, so this is um, the concourse pipeline to deploy Bosch and to deploy Cloud Foundry itself uh, so it's not too complex. We don't do a lot of resource handling in uh, Conqueror's resources. We do that ourselves. Um, but as you can see, you need to build this, maintain it, understand it, and you have a Git workflow in the end. So that's um, pretty nice once you understand it, but it's like a huge learning curve uh, to get started for the team. Um, also, what turned out to be really, really great is in designing these pipelines to first configure and upload things then to deploy things and then to smoke test. So that's like the standard pattern we use, like to really always have a smoke test at the end. So if the deployment fails, then the smoke test latest should like discover that the deployment actually has failed. So we intend to like really build and automate, um, but there's like little time and so much to code. So what we want to do is like automated release integration testing um, before we actually deploy it um, to to a, like a use a foundation that's being used. We want to like bundle things and download all these um, things like before we deploy them. Um, we also have a GitOps workflow that that works, um, of course, um, but we also want to like improve and streamline that. So there's there's more to come. Um, but yeah, that's like kind of the, the process we have around the platform. But there's more, so like for support, uh, there's like literally no process anymore. Uh, but what you can do and what, what the company needs to do is like get involved in the community. So there's like lots of places where you can get involved, contribute, give back. So there's the Slack channel, obviously, um, which is like really great. Um, there's GitHub, lots of projects. You can get involved in, in issues, resources everywhere. We have like Twitter, um, mailing lists also. But in the end, there's like no SLAs on all of these kind of things. So if you need support, um, you can hope that someone is willing to give support. 
but you can't rely on that. So that's like also something the enterprise needs to deal with. I mean, um, also when it comes to bug fixing and patching, it's um, we can't really patch currently. So we need to learn Go. Like that's the first thing. Then you need to compile it. Then you need to create the Bosch release. So that's a huge chain of things you need to do to really patch it yourself. Um, so that's that's a huge thing um, that's still like for next year. There's also, once you patch it or fix it, um, please give it back. So that's like also really difficult or if you do other things uh, for, um, for, because companies usually don't open source uh, stuff. And the last part now is about the culture. Um, so the first thing we had is an agile uh, setting. So this was like the base of what we do. Um, because what we want to do is like deliver value and we want to do it fast. Um, that's really important and like that involves a lot of things because it's not the way people used to work before. So it's also like not only all these technological and, and tooling changes, it's also the way they work together changed. So we have a backlog, it's prioritized, we have stand-up meetings, we do different forms of collaboration like pairing, mob programming and things. So that's like also really a challenge for the people to adapt to that. I mean, it takes some time. Now they are used to it, uh, which is great. And now they are like in a state where they can uh, really reap the benefits they, they gained from this kind of thing. Um, but it just takes time. And that's like what it, what's uh, really important to say. Um, also failure happens. I mean, there's a lot of companies where there's a, a really bad blame culture. Um, so if you want to do open source, get rid of that first. Um, luckily, we did not have to deal with these kind of things, uh, but still with open source Cloud Foundry, it's really easy to do, to do things wrong or to get things wrong. We also had like kind of states where it wasn't that, that great, um, but it's like really important to not blame people for doing that. Because if you don't take the risk in doing things, then it's gonna stand still, right? Um, but also on the other hand, appreciate if someone did a good job. So that's really, really important. Um, we also had a, a great party after we went live. Um, so that's like also really important, just like celebrating and, and achieving what you have, like celebrating what you've achieved. Which brings me to the last point here about giving back. Um, so I think if you wanna do open source Cloud Foundry, you're like, kind of you, you need to give back because you live from the community and the only thing that you can do is like to contribute back. So there's like lots of ways um, to contribute. You can share what you do, how you do it. You can raise issues, um, contribute patches, get involved. Uh, that's really, really an important thing. And so we just started with this and we came up with this Cloud Foundry Operator's Guide where we want to share how we actually did it. So for the technical details, um, you can go here. Um, it's like really the first draft. Uh, we will update and evolve this over time. But this is kind of the, the high-level documentation of how we do the, the scripts, the architecture of our directories, the things. So that's... Um, have a look there. It's going to be updated over time. You can... It's on GitHub also. You can participate and write the documentation or improve it. Um, so yeah, would we do this again? Um, definitely. Uh, so that's, it was really interesting. Everyone learned a lot. Uh, so that was um, really, really great. Um, everyone like also grew personally because of a huge amount of challenges and tools we learned. But there's also like only consider this if like the path is really part of your business strategy or you can also like run Cloud Foundry next to some, some vendor, but you really need to be dedicated on, on running the open source version. If you're not dedicated and you don't want to invest in these kind of things, then you better not do it. So thanks for joining. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm still here. Um, yeah, and also on Twitter. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs>